Hi everyone, my name's Alec, but you might know me as Rickbick. A little while ago, I made a video theorizing an analog controller side dashback fix. And I hinted at it a little bit in the end of the video, but I've actually done a lot more than just theorize that circuit. If you haven't seen that video, I really strongly suggest you go watch it because it's going to be crucial to the understanding of this video. I've linked it down in the description. So we left off last time with a pretty clear understanding of what we wanted our circuit to do. We had these two conditions that said that one, we were moving quickly away from the neutral position, and two, we were out of the dead zone. And if both of these conditions were met, then the circuit would make the signal jump to a full right or full left input, effectively eliminating the rise time. The crucial information here is the position of the stick and the velocity of the stick. Depending on whether these are positive or negative, we're going to either pass through our raw signal or select a full right or full left input. I denote a full right input as VS, or the supply voltage, and a full left input as zero volts. I also write the velocity as DX DT, or the derivative of the position. If that doesn't mean anything to you, then just keep thinking about it as the velocity. As you can see, a positive position and a positive velocity yields a full right output, a negative position and a negative velocity yields a full left output, and everything else just passes through the raw signal. This is still way too abstract for a circuit to understand though, so we're going to break it down even further. I'm going to build a truth table based on four booleans. Is the position positive and above the dead zone? Is the position negative and below the dead zone? Is the derivative positive? And is the derivative negative? Based on whether these are true or false, or high or low, or zero or one, or however you want to call it, we're going to determine our output. This might seem kind of daunting at first, but we can actually simplify it a lot. It's impossible for our position to be above the dead zone and below the dead zone at the same time, so we can eliminate all of those. And it's also impossible for our derivative to be positive and negative at the same time, so we can eliminate anything that has a 1 in both of those columns. Now we have something that's much more manageable to work with. And we're still really only looking for two cases. We're looking for when the position and the derivative are positive, and when the position and the derivative are negative. In every other case, we're just going to pass the raw signal. Alright, so... Boom! This is it. This is, uh, this is a generalized schematic of the entire circuit. It might kind of look like a lot at first, but you'll see once we break it down piece by piece that it's really not that complicated. The first piece that we're going to look at is what I call the trigger. This attenuates our slow inputs and also gives us our derivative term. What's actually drawn on the page here is called a Salen Key High Pass Filter, and we're going to build one with a really low Q factor. This is about to get pretty technical, but the important points are that around our operating frequency it acts as a differentiator, and below our operating frequency it attenuates the signal with a steep cutoff. The best way to understand what this filter does is to look at its transfer function. Our transfer function has gain on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis. Since we're using a second-order filter, we'll have two poles. To the left of both poles, we'll attenuate the signal with a steep cutoff. Between the poles, the circuit will act as a differentiator. And to the right of both poles, it'll pass the signal. We can place the two poles by choosing resistor and capacitor values. Just remember that we want our dash inputs to be in the differentiator region. If that made no sense at all, then you're totally fine. Just think of it as a black box where the input is the position of the stick and the output is the derivative of that position, or the velocity. Next we're going to be looking at the circuit's four comparators. Comparators are super simple. They have two inputs and one output. If the non-inverting input, denoted by a plus sign, is greater than the inverting input, or minus sign, then the output will be high. If it's lower, then the output will be low. Each of these comparators represents one of the booleans we saw in our truth table. From top to bottom, they decide if the position of the stick 
is positive and above the dead zone, if the velocity of the stick is positive, if the velocity of the stick is negative, and then if the position of the stick is negative and below the dead zone. The last part of the circuit that we're going to look at is the logic portion. This is what actually takes in all of those inputs and decides what to do with them. There are only two different components in this part of the circuit. There are those two AND gates on the left and then a 2-bit multiplexer on the right. All that an AND gate does is return high when both of its inputs are high and low otherwise. Our 2-bit multiplexer has two inputs and four possible outputs. So depending on what each input is, it'll choose one of the outputs. In our case, it's going to choose the raw signal, a full right input, or a full left input. Based on how we have our MUX set up, it's actually not possible for both select inputs to be high, so I'm just tying that pin to ground. So now let's remember what was going on with the rest of the circuit and see how this fits in. We're connecting the raw signal to one of the pins of our MUX, and then the output of our MUX is going to the analog digital converter inside the controller. At the four pins of those AND gates, we had those comparators that tell us if our position is positive or negative and if our velocity is positive or negative. So we'll take one last look at the full schematic so you guys can pause it and work it out for yourselves if you want. But otherwise, uh, that's about it. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I'm guessing if you've made it this far, you probably want to see some more. And I have some good news for you. This is kind of part two of a part three series, I guess. Uh, where part three, I'm going to be talking about implementation with the controller and gameplay and how I chose my RC constants and components and that sort of thing. Um, but right now, I just want to be really, really transparent with the community. Um, I do plan on selling this, but before I do that, I want to talk about it more and pretty much release everything I've done with it. And I also want to talk about what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, it's not going to instantly fix all of your backdashes, but what it will do is offer consistent behavior, whereas the polling of the with the controller is pretty random. So it really does not make them easy, but it makes them consistent. The tough part is that you still have to accelerate the stick fast enough to trigger the circuit while you're within the dead zone, which is really fast. So pretty much I found that anytime you're trying to go for a backdash, it's easy to do so, but if you're not trying to, if your finger's just resting on the stick normally, then it will definitely improve your dash back rate, but it won't make it 100%. What I can guarantee about the circuit is that on any controller you put it on, it will increase your dash back rate. And that's also not to say that it doesn't have the potential to make it perfect. Um, I just haven't spent a lot of time tuning it. You see, there's a lot of thresholds and you have to adjust your resistors and capacitors. Um, but I've also been in touch with some other modders in the community and I'm gonna send them boards. I know, I'm so sorry guys that I haven't yet. I know, I'm a lazy bum, I've been on break. Um, but I'm hoping the more people I get it out to will give me more feedback and even try tuning it themselves and hopefully just get better and better results. Uh, this is the, the last board that I made. This one works. It's too big to fit in the controller though. I also made this one. This is the size of the final one, but it's missing some newer additions I made onto it. So this one doesn't work, but this one does work. Uh, this has kind of been my testing platform. And um, I am gonna make another one that's this size, and that's what I actually plan on distributing to people. It'll kind of fit where the rumble pack goes, so sorry, you'll have to take your rumble pack out. But uh, Thank you guys again for watching, and stick around, because I'm going to be putting out more stuff soon.